was 15 months old when uh, they took my mother away to be institutionalized, as it turned out to be, for almost half a century. I stayed with a woman in Detroit, in Detroit East Side in the Polish neighborhood. And I would be able to periodically see my father because he used to come to the Polish club to play pinochle. So I would go in there and snatch some small change off the table where he was too embarrassed to take it away from me again. My guardian took me to actually visit my mother and I was five years old. They told her that I was her daughter and she sat me in her lap, but she didn't have a clue who I was. And that's the only actual episode that I recall of having any contact with her. I went to the local drugstore and I said, you don't have to pay me, but I'd like to learn how to be a soda jerk. And so I worked there for the week and they insisted on giving me a little money at the end of the week after all. But I was able to go and look for a job and say, oh, I've had this experience. What I would do is I would get a job, work in a locale, however long I wanted to stay there, stay at the local Y, and then take off and go to another locale. I went cross country, actually, all the way from California to Georgia and from Florida up to Michigan by Greyhound bus at that point. And I did a lot of traveling. Two weeks shy of my 18th birthday, I went down south and married a soldier. I'd been corresponding with him for, oh, over a year or so. Six weeks later, he went overseas, and he was gone for three years and four months. I wanted desperately to join the Army, but at that point, you had to be 20 years old before they would let you join. Males were allowed to join when they were 16, but the women had to wait till 20, and I thought that wasn't fair. So I uh, messed around with my birth certificate. They didn't look too closely and I joined the Army. I used to spend all my time going into doing laps in swimming pools so that I was able to swim endlessly. So when I did join the Army, I had already qualified as a lifeguard. And so they gave me that job. And I had my basic training in a place called Daytona Beach. Yeah, I know, I died and gone to heaven on that one. The name of my first husband was Thomas Nichols, and the guys, if they all wanted to go swimming, they had to come and ask me to take them because I was a lifeguard. They uh, used to sometimes come, three or four of them together, and they would stand outside the barracks and sing at me, nickels, dimes, quarters. So I was very, very popular. Right after I got out of the Army, which was mid-October sometime, motorcycles were finally available to the civilian population. The first week of November, I believe the 7th or 8th of November, I went to the local Harley store and I bought a motorcycle. It was a 1946 model, 45 cubic inch displacement motor, and I gave it the name Toujours Gay. And at the time, this was just, you know, a female driving motor. I used to go down the street and, ah, woman on a motorcycle. <laughs> girl on a motorcycle. Oh yeah, no, I, I attracted a lot of attention back then. I tootled around the country with that motorcycle and I heard about this place called John Heron Art Institute. And I decided to go there and become a student. And in the springtime, I knew that if that motorcycle was in that garage beckoning to me, and I was trying to go to school, it was never going to happen. So with a heavy heart, I sold the motorcycle, which would probably be worth a small fortune now. At the end of the first year, I happened to win an award called the Louise Vonnegut Award. It was given to me as, as a sculptor for having you know done excellent work that first year. I used to do portrait sculptures. I was looking at my own pictures of my own work, and I'm kind of impressed. I was good. I was really very good. After I won my Vonnegut Award the first year, 
I felt it was proper that I should at least go in for a second year. And at the end of the second year, I got a bicycle and I bicycled cross country to Black Mountain College. This is the place where Joseph Albers was teaching. And not only Joseph Albers, but the place is loaded with alumni, all of whom I would say 50% of them are world famous in their own respective fields. I got the job of driving a uh, weapons carrier and the helper on that truck was Robert Rauschenberg, world famous inventor of pop art. Well, he and I used to collect garbage together. And the thing was, we took the garbage away and we usually came back with more of it than we went away with because he would paw through it and figure out stuff that he could use for his own creative processes. That's turned into an anecdote that's gone around the world as far as I know. <laughs> at, at Black Mountain College is where I met Chuck. He came in in the latter part of my stay there. We hadn't known each other very long and we got married. I got pregnant with my oldest son, who at the time, oh, for the first few years of his life, he called him Tammy. I went to Williamstown in Massachusetts that had Williams College and enrolled Chuck there in his freshman year to uh, work towards a degree so that he could qualify as a teacher. And we decided for him to get a graduate degree. And by now, I would already had another baby. I've had Dunstan. Dunstan was born in Adams, and we went to the University of Georgia, and Scott was born down there in Athens, Georgia. We lived in Hanover, and ultimately found a piece of property in, in Lyme. Gosh, it was a wonderful place. It had a brook, and we had a tire hanging from a rope, which used to swing out, and the kids used to swing on that thing, and even when Drew was a baby, the boys, you know, would take him out there and swing him on that tire. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely heaven on earth for the children. We lived next door to a doctor, and he allowed me to have a home birth. And so when Drew was born, I had him in my house in Lyme, New Hampshire. And ultimately, I got pregnant with Adrienne, and my mantra over the years has been Thank God for daughters, because she has been now in my old age, my godsend and blessing, and that's the only reason that I'm living this close to the Arctic Circle. Chuck had had to go and take a job at the University of Toronto. And as a matter of fact, the art department didn't even exist. They brought Chuck in and built the art department. And we moved into Canada, and there was this house in Pickering and it was a fabulous buy, $15,900. And me with my frugal ways and means, I had the money. Yeah, when we lived in Pickering, we had purchased this big trampoline and we were the most popular family in the entire community because, you know, the kids just loved playing on it. This was, this was a brand new item on the, on the market. I mean, nobody had trampolines. There was a family that came through that had built themselves a covered wagon and they were going around the world and that gave me the idea that I should do that too. So built the covered wagon and took it over into the States. And we got to a place called French Lick, Indiana. Gosh, I remember that. I remember that so clearly. Because I'm in the Virgin Islands and I'm stuck there for the next four days, I went to the local sales shop and I said, look, you don't have to pay me, but just give me some work to do so I have something to do while I'm waiting for my plane to take me back again. And so they put me on this one machine and gave me all their junk sales to mend and whatnot. They could tell that I knew what the heck I was doing with that sewing machine, and the woman they had hired knew nothing at all. They let her go and they offered me the job. Well, by this time, I was gonna have to make a trip back north to get my stuff in order to be able to stay in the Virgin Islands. It was. It was wonderful. Died and gone to heaven. I just loved, just loved that work. Just loved it. I had always admired uh, the work of Carl Jung. I knew that I was subject to spells of depression and they lasted for decades. By reading a great deal of literature, 
This was the dumbest thing in the world you can possibly do. I tried to analyze myself. And uh, at some point, I went to Switzerland to study at the Jung Institute. I was very much impressed with the work of Carl Jung as opposed to Sigmund Freud. I did not like Sigmund Freud because he felt that the ultimate goal in life was sexual in nature, whereas Carl Jung felt that it was spiritual, that it was a pursuit of, of godliness. But I can remember one dramatic day when I said to myself, I'm the one that can do something about it. And I decided then and there that I was going to just not get depressed anymore. And I can remember having only one more spell of depression the following month, and it was very mild, and I've never had another spell of depression since that time. We went to Bali, and I fell in love with the place with the uh, textiles that were available from Indonesia. And so I promptly scheduled another trip and went the following year, so I went two years in a row. I would go into the plain textile department and just buy three yards of absolutely every color. I've been using those textiles ever since, and I've still tons of them left. I like working with silver, I like working with brass, I like working with, with uh, uh, wires, I like working, you know, whatever the medium was, I like working with it. And so at one point, I remember deliberately thinking to myself, what can I do when I'm 95, and how can I get a one-man show into a Volkswagen? And at that point, I decided to focus on textiles. I started making quilts, but the problem with quilts was that they were unbelievably undervalued because they were utilitarian. And so I decided to make quilted wall hangings that were non-utilitarian, that used the process of quilting, but were, could only be displayed, hung on a wall as, 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 a, as a painting or anything else. When, once you're 65, you could go to university tuition free. And it just accidentally happened to be on my birthday that I went down there and registered for uh, courses there. And I went through the entire course and earned, actually honestly earned my degree. I got a bachelor's degree, which is mine. It wasn't honorary and it wasn't done because stuff was allowed for. I actually earned it. I wasn't quite 70 yet. I was close to my 70th birthday. And I wanted to go skydiving, so sure. And we just dropped out of the plane and fell for, it seemed like forever, because we were up so high. And then all of a sudden got yanked when the parachute engaged. This one motorcycle group uh, actually honored me. And I was living in, in the senior's residence. There were about 50 or 60 motorcycles all in a row and the police came by, you know, wondering if the motorcyclists were bothering them and they saw us coming in with me. <laughs> Toujours Gay comes from Archie and Mehitable. And so Toujours Gay, oh yeah, this was Mehitable's little song. She would say, Toujours Gay, Toujours Gay, there's a dance left in the old dame yet. <laughs> <laughs>